Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad that you have come along. And I have a very interesting show for you today. I think you're going to be fascinated by it, particularly those of you who are engaged in the kind of the broad Pan Wesleyan movement, as it's called these days. Some people don't know about the Association of Independent Methodists. And I, if that's you, if you never heard of this group, I'm so glad to introduce you. But before I do that, I want to make sure you know that more to this story is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we have just been approved by the Global Methodist Church. We've been serving the Association of Independent Methodists since our founding. We are as a part of our founding. So we have all kinds of groups that we serve, but we're not necessarily affiliated with one denomination. But we are training leaders to serve churches that are remaining true to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And so we're so excited to have various academic programs lay initiatives that we'd love for you to check out. And you can find more about us at WBS at wbs.edu. Secondly, I am thankful to my friend, Bill Roberts, who's a financial planner who helps uh, make this podcast happen. He helps people you know, plan for their future and to achieve their goals, particularly people who are in ministry, who have interesting things they think about, whether it's a housing allowance or these type of things or how to plan for your future retirement goals. I'd love for you to check out Bill's ministry at williamhroberts.com, and you can find a link to him in my show notes. And finally, for those of you who are looking for that next Sunday school curriculum or that next small group Bible study, I have this little short study. It's six sessions, about a half an hour each with discussion guides on the little book of Jude. It's 20, you know, just 25 verses in that book. But really, it's just this attempt to go deeper into one little book. And this little book has an incredible power for our time. So I'd love for you to check that out at andymillerthe3rd.com under courses. And it's something that you can use in a Sunday school class or a sermon series or these type of things. I'd love to bring that to you. So at Andy Miller the third, Andy Miller II.com. All right. I am glad to welcome in my friends to this podcast. Reverends, I suppose I should say, I just call them by their first name, but um, Marshall Dagg and Adam Godbold, who are pastors in the Association of Independent Methodists. Guys, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Now, uh, we were just talking, you're making me feel so good because you guys actually occasionally listen to my podcast too. So uh, thank you for uh, being one of the one of the few, the called, the chosen, who, who listen. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. Adam, what were you saying? You were saying that you you were, uh, you were had a book right behind you that you, you were even uh, influenced by because of podcasts. Yeah, no, J.P. Moreland's book, uh, A Simple Guide to uh, Experience Miracles. I, I had heard of it, and of course, I'm a bit of a J.P. Moreland fan, but I had not picked up that book until I heard you interviewing him about it, and I bought it that day, and I have since finished reading it. Um, yeah, it was it was a really good podcast episode. Kudos to you, Andy, for, for oh, thank you. it, but uh, it was a really good book. It was fascinating. It's really challenged me as a pastor in really huge ways. Yeah, and Adam, tell us where you serve. Uh, I serve Faith Methodist Church in the Marietta, Georgia area. It's a okay. small uh, independent Methodist church, part of the Association of Independent Methodists. And it's uh, right in, uh, well, the west side of, of Marietta. Gotcha. And Marshall, how about you? Where are you serving? I'm in Madison, Alabama, which is North Alabama, right up against Huntsville, which is the okay. uh, number one city to live, apparently, in the United States. Oh, Georgia. really? Now, why is yeah. that? What, well, what do you it, have it was Newsweek. Newsweek put it out uh, a few months back, and uh, they have a list always like top fifty places to live in America. And Huntsville, Alabama, was number one. Wow! There it's, you go. It's Marshall's Church. Yeah, that's one hundred percent. Yeah, no, for sure. No. <laughs> Marshall, tell us about your church. This was, you planted this church. Is that correct? Yes. So out of seminary, uh, moved to the area and started the church, and have been there uh, the whole time, and so. Yeah, we uh we actually just put out a um a devotional that that uh included some of the names you would know and so have have distributed that throughout the association and all that but that came from out of our church but it was kind of for an aim audience and that in that sort of way so yeah okay interesting now this is well, well, before we go there, uh, you guys are both graduates of Wesley Biblical Seminary as well. And you, 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 did you come through Wesley Biblical Seminary with the intention of serving in the Association of Independent Methodists, which, by the way, folks, we might call it AIM throughout this time. But um, was, was that your plan? Is that what you felt God leading you to do when you came to seminary? Yes, absolutely. So 
I, I, I forget Adams coming in, but we actually went to college together first. So not only did we grow up in AIM, again, the acronym there, together, but, uh, but we actually went to the same college, which is Wesley College, which today no longer exists. I However, know. I know that there is an initiative at Wesley Biblical Seminary for the college at WBS, which to me is, is a wonderful thing because the alma mater that we both have no longer exists today, but this, this certainly I hope is going to take the place of that. But so we went to college together and then went to seminary, um, both at WBS and um, graduated from there. But I had the intention for sure of, of ministering within AIM and um, was seeking further theological education. Yeah, same thing. I guess same thing for you, Adam. Yes. So right out of college, uh, my wife and I got married, Lindsay, um, and she actually grew up with Marshall at, uh, at oh, Marshall interesting church. Yeah, as a child, and so we got married right out of college and moved here, uh, and we're working with the youth at, at at Faith Methodist Church. And we, our long term dream was to was to remain. Our pastor was who was also an alumnus of uh, WBS. Uh, was getting a bit older, and his vision was that we would take over as as a pastoral family of uh, mm. Methodist. But a couple of years in, we we were uh, a number of family things were going on with us, and and um, we we felt called by God to return to uh, Mississippi in order to attend WBS. And so uh, so I started at WBS a couple of years after Marshall. And then we we promptly moved moved back uh, here to take over at Faith Methodist Church uh, just three years later. Gotcha. Okay, so a lot of people maybe don't know that when we say the word Methodist in the United States, that generally brings to mind, um, particularly in the South, United Methodist. Now, I grew up in the Midwest, and there were Free Methodist churches there, uh, but that that was pretty much it. That was connected to the name. Methodist. And so a lot of people aren't aware of the diversity within Methodism. Now, I like to think because I come from the Salvation Army. We have students here from Nazarene, Wesleyan, all kinds of groups. And then historically, you have Pilgrim Holiness Denomination, all kinds of groups that can come out of the holiness movement. But even I, I've been surprised in my time at Wesley Biblical Seminary to become aware of other groups that I had heard about historically existing maybe in England, like primitive Methodist, congregational Methodist, that's in the United States, um, Protestant Methodist, and you all, of course, as well. So I'm, I'm just curious, like, when you are working through this, is, is the is the naming something that is that you run into on a regular basis? Do people think you're United Methodist at the same time? I know, yes, uh, we we do often uh, get asked, wait a minute, so are you guys United Methodists? And we quickly say, no, we're independent Methodists. Uh, but but just a fun fact, I always tell folks that, uh, uh, no, actually, Association of Independent Methodists predates the formation of the United Methodist Church. So we're not a reaction to them, That's they're true. a reaction to us. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of people don't realize, of course, that the United Methodist Church was just previously the Methodist Church until it combined with the Evangelical United Brethren. So you guys were before that. Now, let's just start with the first word. And I'll let Adam, I'll ask you this. What's up with the, the even calling an association? You all are pretty particular. You're not a denomination, but an association. What's that about, Adam? I think it's all about trying to get uh, higher on the list in the phone book or something. <laughs> uh, so we are an association of churches. We, we, we do not have like a, uh, a powerful centralized government. Uh, we, we don't have bishops, uh, district superintendents or anything like that, that most folks would associate with a denominational uh, system. Uh, we do have a, a, an executive board. Uh, we call it the executive committee, and it and it serves as leadership and oversight. But we literally only have one one paid staff person, and she's our office manager. And so wow. she, you know, she she works through applications that come in to us, and, and puts together references and all all sorts of stuff that goes on uh, in the day to day operations of a denomination of sorts. But we are an association of independent congregations. Uh, they are Methodist in doctrine, but we're almost like, I describe it as a cooperative of, of independent congregations that are Methodist in doctrine. They call their own yeah. pastors. They own their own property. Some of them, like us, rent property. We actually meet in a bowling alley. So, you know, uh, uh, we've got each of our each of our congregations kind of uh, have a different 
expression of, of, of who yeah. they are. Some are more traditional, some are more contemporary, uh, some are highly liturgical, some are, are very uh, low church, non-liturgical. Um, but all of these independent congregations have the commonality of being independent, but also being Methodist in their doctrine. And we do together what we can't do alone, which is where the idea of an association comes in. We do camps and retreats and all sorts of training events. We scholarship students and do all sorts of things together that we just cannot do on our own. Yeah, Marshall, one of the things that comes about is that you might even think, well, do we even need to have any sort of network? After all, if we're just going to be by ourselves, like what's the benefit of being in an association or even a denomination or any sort of group in the, like in this day and time? Yeah, sure. No. I mean, yeah, you could be out on your own, but I don't I don't think the vision in the New Testament is of doing something just out on your own. I mean, because at that point, you would have to ordain yourself. You would have to or be be self-governing in, in what I would imagine is an unhealthy way, whereas the association allows for one to be self-governing in a healthy way. And that's that's really what we would love to see happen. And we, we try to attempt to cultivate is an idea that, yes, there's an independence, but that has to do with polity and not fellowship. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. the, the polity is, is, yeah, you know, you're self-governing the church. And I, you know, personally speaking, and again, I am in AIM and always have been, but I, I think every church should be self-governing self in this way. And, and that each church is locally autonomous and should be able to run itself and support itself. And yet, and yet be associated with like-minded brothers and sisters. And, and plus, you know, when you do things together, you can always do, do more than you can alone. And so, you know, we want to, as Adam said, create these sort of opportunities where we can help train people on a, on a broader scale than just say a local church could do alone. And plus, you know, it gets lonely out there in ministry. I mean, anybody that's been a pastor for two years would know that. And so to have brothers and sisters that, that you're associating with regularly, um, to have someone that is behind you, uh, with you in the fight is, uh, is just invaluable. Yeah. And there, there's something too about the authority that people have. So like by you guys, and I identified you as reverend, so you've been ordained by AIM, but nevertheless, there's also something else that's involved. Like there's, there's like a doctrinal fidelity that's needed in a, in a denomination. Marshall, what do you, I mean, isn't that one of the functions as well? So you, you need this, uh, this to be in fellowship, but you also need accountability. Is that one of the things that oh. AIM provides? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's always the struggle of of how much reach and overreach, you know, is in an organization. Right. And so, you know, being independent has its own struggles. I mean, we we would be first to say that. I mean, if you choose the yeah, the Association of Independent Methodists, it has its own struggles that other groups don't have. And we have good things that we don't have to worry about because they're not our problem. And so, you know, you can have too much overreach and of course you can have too little. And, um, and so we like to think that we, we do provide that sort of accountability, doctrinally speaking. And, um, and, and like I said, fellowship wise as well, that nobody's out on their own, but also no one is abusing uh, their power and has no one to turn to, you know, in, in this regard. So, yeah. You know, it's not like we have authority as the association to come in and and change things at the local le level other than revoking someone's license or ordination in this way because they're preaching something um, contrary to uh, the scriptures, but also then to our articles of belief. And, and your the commitment that you have, Marshall, one time you explained this to me, and Adam, I'd be glad for you to address this. It's just like, it's not... A, a large book or multiple books or, or hit, it's like a couple of pages, right? Is, is, is yeah. that right? Or is that an exaggeration? Marshall, you want to address that? Well, jump in, Adam. Yeah, go for it. So, so we have uh, 30 articles of religion uh, or articles of belief, um, which if I'm not mistaken, the first 24 are taken directly from what Wesley gave to the American Methodists. Uh, right, and the Sunday service. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, we so we have a constitution which has all of our bylaws and whatnot in there as well, and um, and that's I mean that's pretty much it. We have we do have uh, an old book of uh, forms of worship uh, that that involves like the rituals and and, and whatnot, 
uh, which Marshall uh, Marshall's been talking about actually reproducing that in a uh, more modernized and, and, and updated way for our pastors and local churches. But uh, yeah, we don't have um, we, we're very we're very streamlined in um, in our uh, what incorporates us as an association. Now, before we get into the history, Adam, I want you to talk about that in just a second. But there's there's something more too involved here that I was honestly shocked when I asked. I don't know who I asked. Maybe it was Marshall, but there's some other AIM churches around here. I said, "Well, tell me, how, how does the uh, apportionment or or whatever you offer to the association, how does that work?" Uh, Marshall, why don't you tell us how how does that work? You know, yeah, it it's it works about the same way as a mo- as a local church would work in the sense of their membership. How many people are required to give in a local church? I mean, maybe some churches do that, but I'm not aware of many that you get kicked out if you don't give a certain amount. And so we do the same thing. We would lo- we want our um, the giving that comes into aim to be given joyfully, to be given freely, to be given generously. And so point blank, there's no certain amount. And it, it could wow. be, you know, it could be a hundred dollars or it could be a hundred thousand dollars, which we've never received at an unknown of, but <laughs> we gladly receive and use well. We're but nonetheless, um, you know, it so it really, yeah, there is no apportionment. We, and, and we so you don't even go ahead, Adam. Yeah. We literally have congregations that are in a position where they they cannot and do not give a dime to the association wow. uh and, and most of those are smaller really struggling churches uh but some of our smaller churches are some some of our more generous churches also and, and one of the things marshall mentioned generosity we have found that generosity breeds generosity the more we equip the local church the more we uh scholarship pastors and do free leadership training and things like that the money just comes in we don't even have to ask for it wow. uh our president, Hal Dag, who happens to be Marshall's father, um, he he prides himself on, I'm not asking for a dime. You know, I, wow. I don't ask a church to give. We we model giving for them and, and they give. And uh, some of our churches tithe. Some of them give, you know, set amounts uh, monthly or annually or, you know, weekly. Um, and so it, it our giving is 100% freely done. Wow. It, it, I, it's like some people are listening to this. Like, you should go hit rewind. I don't know if it's rewind or the back button. Like, yes, they did right. say like, they don't require. My, let me just give you an idea. Uh, this is how diverse Wesleyan denominations can be. Like, and I am on, like if the Association of Independent Methodists is here on local autonomy, the Salvation Army is like uh, miles away. And, and, and there's strengths to that. Like, more people in the United States know the Salvation Army than know AIM or the United Methodist Church, which is probably more toward the Salvation Army side and their control from the top down. Like, and, and, and this is a part of just the way that organizations work, organizational psychology in general. Like, what does what does a group mean? What does it mean to be a part of a group? Well, in those denominations and the United Methodist Church, as it works now, the ownership is at the top. And in, and in the Salvation Army, everything is owned. And I, like kind of the joke, the running joke is in the Salvation Army. And like the thing is, it's not just a joke. It's true. Like my grandmother would say, don't jump on the general's sofa. Right. Like <laughs> because My sofa that I grew up with like in, in the, until we I came to WBS, I had never lived in a house that was owned by the people in the house. Like I always was in a house that was owned by the the Salvation Army. And my wife grew up in the United Methodist Church and the similar type of thing. Well, my sofa growing up was always essentially owned by the general, like owned by the Salvation Army Incorporated. And so like that's a part of what happens in these movements. And just to describe how this was, um, I think, I don't think this is betraying any trust or anything like this for me. It, um, the apportionment, uh, equivalent of that in my denomination, I walked into a, a Salvation Army that I was responsible for leading that hadn't paid its apportionments for many years, and it was over $3 million. Now, that was a liability on a balance sheet, okay? Like, that's what it was. Like, okay, you can't pay it now, but this will be paid in some way or some in, in somehow. So and I've heard similar stories in the United Methodist Church. Like, you have this liability to be a part of this group and so there's this tension that always exists between the top and the bottom. And, and I'm wondering, Adam, is that is there a historical reason why you all have 
why AIM has moved this way? Well, yes. So when we were founded, there were there were at least three factors at play. Two of which were kind of this this centralized power that was uh, that was becoming in some ways uh, misused. I don't want to say abusive. I wasn't alive then, uh, but everything I've read shows that the centralized power was was being was being wielded. Um, yeah. Another, which was kind of the corollary of that, was was that you had the local church was basically being sidelined from the governance of the Methodist church. And so you had local congregations that were basically just expected to go to church on Sunday mornings, pay their tithes, send in the apportionments, and and keep their mouths shut. They weren't involved in the leadership. They weren't involved in the decision-making process of the direction of the Methodist church at that time. Right. Um, and so that sort of stuff was going on then. And honestly, our, our kind of reaction to that centralized power and developing an organization that has no bishops and has no centralized power, really, uh, that's been a benefit to us, but it's also been a, a bane to us. I mean, from wow. our very beginning, we have struggled with maintaining congregations because wow. we have congregations that, that will easily come into us and they can just as easily leave. Right. In fact, that was one of the reasons why WBS was founded was to try to curtail that problem and raise up theologically educated, faithfully biblical pastor theologians, which most independent Methodist churches just did not have at that time. So, you know, you'd have a good, faithful local congregation that was struggling to find a pastor and they'd bring somebody in who's either theologically not trained or is theologically trained in 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 uh in in another theological uh distinction or do, uh, doctrinal distinction and um uh would lead the congregational way and you know that that independent congregation could just mo move on and uh so so one of the reasons why uh why they sought to the leadership at that time in the early 70s sought to uh to establish a a uh a, a master's uh program in theology in the deep south was to train Methodist pastors to pastor these independent congregations in order to grow the organization, in order to grow the health of the organization as well. And um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So the WBS came out of AIM and eventually then not long into our founding, like became separate, but still with the aim, with the aim, with the aim of serving AIM, uh, <laughs> right? That, like that was a part of what was happening there. Marshall, were there in that time, I'm not sure if I imagine you both are aware of the history. Was there also theological re reasons? Now, polity is theological. Polity is ecclesiological at the same time. But were there other theological distinctives as to why um AIM broke off from what was then the Methodist Episcopal Church South? Yeah, Adam's a little more versed on the history, but I do know I do know that one thing about our group from the beginning to even now is that we want to hold to the Methodist Wesleyan distinctive. And so, and of course, you know, if you read Wesley at all, it's, it's, it's that then is the authority of the scriptures, right? As ultimate, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. of course, that has always been, you know, in the forefront of our minds is, is centralized power. If it is going awry, then trickles down, you know, in some kind of almost automatic way to everybody that's being pushed out in the organization. And so likewise, though, we have to, you know, sustain that same sort of more ground roots uh, or grassroots effort of building up those leaders, at least on our end, rather than just sending them out organizationally from the top, so to speak, because we don't have that kind of power. Um, and so, but it's it still is, it, yeah, I mean, I'd say theologically, we want to maintain the authority of the scriptures as inerrant and infallible for all purposes of faith. And then, of course, particularly in the stream of, of Methodism proper. And so in, in a lot of ways, I think it was a return to primitive Methodism, if you can, if you want to use that sure. term, hope, hope yeah. that it doesn't get misconstrued, but like a type of oh. primitive Methodism where it's, it's in its nascent form of growing and being uh, independently multiplying and this sort of thing, rather than centralized control. Right. Then this is what's interesting is like this emphasis, there, there are people in this stream all over the country and the world in, in what I'm just calling the evangelical 
Wesleyan world. Like there's people who want to emphasize the authority of scripture, the inerrancy of scripture. Oftentimes we use that language uh, like we do here at WVS. And then also emphasizing the reality and the opportunity to seek entire sanctification and to experience sanctifying grace in this life. So like that's something that has come about. And it's not a surprise that the churches that are merging from the United Methodist Church as it's breaking apart generally hold to that kind of theology. And that's consistent with um, both Asbury institutions, but also Wesley Biblical Seminary and a few others that are coming out. Like people are looking for these type of things. Well, you guys have been a part of that this group aim has embraced that same tradition all along the way so i i think it's really a powerful testimony to this now it's interesting too you you guys have both said a few times that there are challenges with it like mm -hmm. centralized control has its benefits and what what do you all miss i don't know who to ask this question to but what do you what do you wish you had if you had had central more centralized control I'll, I'll speak from my perspective first, I guess. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things would be just, it's really what Adam already mentioned, kind of, which is which is when you're ordaining your ministers, there's a lot of control if it's centralized, right? You can require these sorts of things, whereas, you know, we don't require that our, that we can't come into a local church, for instance, and say, no, you cannot have that person as your pastor, now, what we can do is say like, hey, that person theologically does not align with us. And, you know, then then there can be repercussions of that. But we can't say like, hey, you know, this guy, I'm not, I don't know that he's uh, this or that or she is this or that. Instead, you know, we, we don't have that kind of control to, to do it from the top. We can revoke license, like I've said earlier. But, you know, sometimes you wish that there was just a requirement where you could push a button, but... But I would also say on the flip side of that, we've seen that abused as well. Just because you're, quote, trained, it matters right. where you're trained. And I think you yeah. would back that up, Andy. You know, Amen. it matters where you're trained and in what you are trained in. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, I would take a, a person who was trying to be spirit led and, and had the authority of scripture over anybody that was, say, you know, neo-Orthodox in their understanding of the resurrection. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, here's one interesting thing too about the centralized power. Do you talk about sending people places? I serve four different congregations, my wife and I together and in, in, in the Salvation Army, husband and wife served together, both ordained. I never served at a congregation that wanted me. Now, now the, the, I forget, I think that they liked me mostly. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it maybe I can think of one that might have tried to pull some strings and talk to the equivalent of the bishop or the commissioner in my case and said, hey, we'd really like to have um, Andy and Abby come. But it, who knows? Who knows how it all worked? But there was never a place where the congregation itself said, you know, we want we want this person to be our leader. And, and you know what that does is there's always this look to like if people don't like a decision that's made, um, they could look to the next person, like the kind of the saying in the Salvation Army is officers come and officers go, praise God from whom all blessings flow, all right? <laughs> like you have this situation where like you just always look into the next or, or also not the local unit or the local church, not, and this is, it's, it's the same in other, other denominations, not wanting to invest as much because they don't have true ownership. Go ahead, Marshall. Yeah, I mean, just on that point, my my dad, who again is currently president of of the association, you know, he would he would say this often, and um, it's it takes about three or four years to really become somebody's pastor. Wow! And if at three or four years you're gearing up to leave, it's almost like this presidential thing where now we're in a thing where yeah, Biden's in there, but we're already looking and assuming who's coming next, and not really paying attention to not coming under the lead, so on and so forth. It's like, you know, there, there's something to be said about long term somewhere where you're actually becoming someone's pastor. And I mean, I can I can say, like, within the association, this is possible. Not only is it possible, the church has the stewardship to make that happen and to be like, you know, we, we actually think that if God is leading his church, he's leading local churches, too. It's not just people at the top he's leading and we know best, but rather many times the local church knows best and the prayer warriors that are there, the people who started it, the leadership that 
God has instilled there, they know what they need. They know what kind of person that, you know, would fit there and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And and then you'd have to, if you find, the, if you want a certain type of person, maybe you said, I, I want to have somebody educated at Oxford and who speaks three languages and is also good at foosball. I don't know. Just throwing out. Okay. Then you're going to go find that person and you'll pay for that person, right? Like it, it, or or not, or you'll readjust your goals, 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 and say, no, foosball isn't required. Like just to Oxford in the three languages. Adam, what what do you what do you think of, like in general? Like anything you want to add at this point before we pivot? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the way our organization is structured, the local church really does have ownership, um, not not over the pastor, but over themselves. And the pastor is a part of the local church. And, and one of the benefits Marshall mentioned three to four years, um, when, when a, when a church is, 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 is in a pattern of the pastor only being there for a handful of years and then moving on, it really is difficult to build continuity. And it, and it does also create a, a, uh, it creates an environment in which the pastor really, uh, uh, is not a part of the congregation and said, he's, mm. he's just, he's a hireling. Almost, and, yeah, and sure. it's not to say anything about somebody who's in a situation where they have moved on after a handful of years. Uh, but when you're when you're with a congregation for an extended period of time, you create stability, you create memories together, you create an identity together. Where you're there when the kids are little, and when they're growing up and getting married, and you know going off to college, and then graduating, yeah. and all those memories that you're developing. The local church really does have a way of becoming a family at that point. Uh, yeah, yeah, where where it's it is multi generational, not just in the people that that are a part of it, but also in the leadership of it, particularly the pastoral leadership of it. The pastor actually becomes a father or mother figure within the family, and not just hired help from the outside to preach a sermon on Sunday mornings and and duly administer the sacraments. You know, right, right. This is so interesting. Now, one of the things that comes up. Um, any, in, in, you know, some people, as I've lived in the South now for 15 years, and now particularly in Mississippi, um, people might say to me not long, if they're really honest, uh, you're not from around here, are you? you know, it, it, even though my Northern family, uh, when they hear me talk, they say, well, you sound so Southern. I'm like, are you kidding? Okay. So, so, so forgive the Yankeeism, the Midwesternism in this. But a lot of times there's a way of looking at anything that has in its title or origin Southern, Southern Baptist, Methodist Episcopal Church South. Um, and, and even like I've heard it here, like with uh, institutions that came around in the early 70s, late 60s, often existed and came about because of challenges with segregation. And there, there often are like kind of racial components to the existence of institutions. And I've heard that. I don't know if, how true it should be. If it's if it's a mischaracterization, uh, make mischaracterization um, connected to AIM. But I would lo love for you to like kind of like even just address some of those things that might come up occasionally. Adam, so, you, so yeah. AIM, AIM was founded in 1965. Uh, okay. That, it was actually, and it's it's kind of the. Uh, uh, organizational child of a group that pre predated that that was formed in 1951 called the the Mississippi Association of Methodist Ministers and Laymen. Uh, okay, you can shorten that to MAML, uh, M A M M L. Okay. But um, but that that organization the actually do what for the test I have it. Uh, <laughs> yes, there will be a test at the end. So MAML was uh, was formed in 1951, and but notice it was Mississippi. Mississippi is the first okay. name, the first word in, in the name of uh, in the name of the organization. It was specifically uh, built by and established by ministers and laymen in Mississippi who were concerned about a a a, uh, a liberalization of theology within the Methodist Church, and that was in '51. So okay. AIM, when it was founded in 1965. It, it saw itself as being something that was larger than just Mississippi. If I'm not mistaken, it was over 1,100 uh, ministers and lay people gathered together to form the Association of Independent Methodists at that wow. time in 1965. Uh, and they saw, they saw what was on the horizon of theological liberalism, and it really did center around the, the centrality of Scripture, um, the undermining of, of the centrality of Scripture. 
questions about the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture, which, you know, really are, are kind of the product of, of what, a couple of hundred years of, of, uh, of uh, uh, scholastic thought around the scriptures. So in 1965, you had the, the formation of the Association of Independent Methodists. Obviously, there were a lot of things happening culturally at that time, particularly in the Deep South. Uh, but from everything I've read, none of the leadership of the Association of Independent Methodists had any had any real involvement in anything that would have been explicitly racial. There were power plays from the Methodist uh, leadership at that time that that were that were uh, you could say racialized um, okay. that were maybe intentionally provocative and whatnot. But um, uh, I've not seen any receipts about what uh, what what would have, and, and I know that's an overused word, but show me the receipts. I've not seen anything, yeah. and I even grew up with because uh, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, at at Riverside Independent Methodist Church. I grew up with some of the the first leaders of the association, and uh, never never thought of them as 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 racist at all. Never never saw anything racist uh, out of them at all. Um, that's as somebody who was born in 1981, uh, who wasn't around when AIM was formed, that's that's what I know and what I don't. And know. so it wasn't explicit. There wasn't like there were organizations in that time, the the 50s and the 60s, that were explicitly racist, right? Like they were this group exists for this reason, and and it excluded some. So that wasn't a part of the organizational structure at the beginning. No, not, no yeah. not at all, to my knowledge, at all. Uh, and and I would even say any organization that you find, whether it's in the 60s or whether it's in, you know, the 20, the, the 2020s, uh, they're going to have people that have prejudices within them. Right, right. Whether it's in the Deep South or in the North or in Africa Amen. or wherever you are, there are, going to be pre there are going to be prejudices within individual people. And systemically, maybe, maybe you could even, you could even find that as well. But that's going to be the case, whether it's AIM, whether it's the Methodist Church, uh, Episcopal South, whether it's the Southern Baptist Church, whether it's the Free Methodist Church. I mean, right. I know. It's true. Like, it, I know it's interesting, Adam, what you say, like, for instance, right now, the obviously the largest Methodist group is United Methodism, which is breaking apart right now. Um, and the groups that are going toward um, uh, the global Methodist Church are often, and I've heard this, I mean, I've heard people mischaracterized in this way they they say they are homophobic right they say so you could say that the global methodist church and people are saying this it is exi existing because it's homophobic well yeah. you could say because uh aim started in the deep south in a time of racial tension similar to the sexual revolution that we're experiencing right now this it, are they are they similar is it a similar issue do you think Adam? i do think it's comparable now now look i can you find people that are in the and, and this this is going to sound like i'm like casting aspersions at other groups i'm not at all um but can you find people who are probably homophobic in the global methodist church sure probably but what what does that even mean what does homophobia even mean are they scared right. of, are they scared uh and so and, and so it's yeah it's it's uh it's easy to to make those sorts of characterizations and what 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 those normally uh where those characterizations normally stem from is an unwillingness to listen and an unwillingness to actually have a, an honest conversation let's right. talk about the things that we disagree upon and listen to one another and i think we'll find an awful lot of common ground but instead folks label you know label others racist or homophobic or islamophobic or whatever it would be you're a liberal you're a conservative that we we throw out these these labels in order to shut down conversation about things that we in some ways agree upon and in other ways disagree upon yeah marshall you want anything there no not really i mean i i, that's, I think that's about right i mean ivan howard who uh helped yeah. form wbs you know was one of our early presidents and so you know I, I what's that our third executive director yeah yeah there you go and so I mean you know we we know people that know him directly and we've never seen any evidence of racially motivated sort of thing now what we have heard is that 
people were placing pastors, whether they were black or whether they were a white pastor here or there, purposefully to teach a lesson. And I would just ask, which one is racist in that? You know, like yeah. you're using right. just like with what you noted here uh, with the homosexual um uh, it's happening right now right yeah i mean you're putting somebody in a certain place to teach these people a lesson who's being used there really i mean and again that's a, that's a kind of abuse of power that is not led by the spirit by any stretch of the imagination and it also yeah. doesn't i mean you know we could we could this is for another day but you know it also doesn't take the black church seriously yeah. yeah, they are not a white church. And 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 as soon as you and, I, and look, we would have to do another podcast, Annie, on this, because I've seen studies that say that really when you're trying to mix the two churches together just to have a multicultural church, the first thing to go is black preaching and black right. singing. And that's a real reality in their tradition. I have a friend in the area that would tell you straight up. It's like, Listen, it has nothing to do with racism. It has everything to do with styles of worship and forms right, of preaching. Right. And so we just erase those. It, it, it just, that's not racism. And that's, that's not the church of Jesus Christ. It's okay to worship differently. And it's right, okay right. to have a multicultural church. And it's, you know, anyway, so again. Now, this is interesting. And, and, and one of the things, and I, I welcome you guys to call me out on this when I say it. Um, and, uh, in, in the Salvation Army, based upon the nature of where we serve and what we serve, it's generally more diverse than other denominations. But at the same time, like probably most of the most of the Salvation Army congregations of the 1200 United States are have an Anglo worship feel, a white worship feel, right? And I've I've generally wondered, like I, I love it when people can come together, but the, the whole charge that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in in our country, like it, it being a sin. I'm not, I'm not positive of that. Like there's like a, a willful choice to go in, in a certain direction. And it's exactly what you said. Like it is a sin to say that uh, you can't, you bar somebody from entering because of their race. Like it's it, to, to just say you can't be a part of this group because of this, but to say there's two different styles and to enable people to experience uh, uh, the Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus wants to do in the world through a form that connects with them like we should have the freedom to be able to be able to do that instead like when you put everything together sometimes that leads to the place where and not everybody loses but there's not the the cultural sensitivity that's needed and it almost has nothing to do with the color of skin it, now i haven't said that out loud particularly on a podcast um but i'm uh, curious if you guys want to respond to that or call me out on anything i said that it might be off no, I couldn't agree more. I, I, that's that's what I maintain is, and and I think there's there's bigger gaps really in socioeconomic levels is what I find in churches. Right. Is these are the ones that oftentimes there's almost a, I don't know what you would call that, and uh, you know a a degradation or whatever you want to call it of people that like, oh yeah, well I can't go there because they're an uppity kind of thing. Those kind of gaps also. We, we never take into consideration, you know, not to uh -huh. say that there's not racism and not to say that there's not issues. Uh, there certainly is, but it, it's not all to do with Sunday morning. <laughs> right, right. In my opinion, it, a lot of it has to, I mean, a lot of it has to do with worship styles and ways of, of preaching that are, are just simply different. And some churches can make that shift and some churches are multicultural in that way but not all. And I don't think you have to have, I don't think if no words you say, oh, well, all your liturgical churches, they're not bringing in this certain group of people, then therefore you need to get rid of liturgies. I, I you know, I don't know that I can agree with that. I don't know that I can go down that route. One of the times I was in a situation where there was a, a, a particular day, like in, in the Salvation Army, and I was preaching in, in it, a relatively enthusiastic sort of person call and response is something that I'm very attuned to and love. And somebody said to me after uh, an African-American person said, uh, my title at the time was captain. They're like, captain, that was so good. We're going to have to start calling this the Salvation Baptist Church. And, <laughs> and, and what he meant was this is more of like, a, it feels more like an, it's an African-American tradition. Like you're, you're, uh, but he was like, almost, <laughs> he's like, you're almost there. Like I wasn't quite, now, now, now let's get back to AIM. What this means for AIM is that like, if there was a, let's say a United Methodist church that historically is black, 
in, in or Hispanic or any any sort of distinction. Um, and, and they say they're wanting to break away from the United Methodist Church at this moment and to disaffiliate. They would be welcome to come to the AIM. Oh, when, absolutely. Yeah. Come aboard, please. <laughs> so like there we've is been, a we've been praying for for that. I've been praying for years for uh, a a black church, his, uh, Hispanic church, like Korean church. Like I'm and, and in fact, right now, I've got some movement on the Hispanic side of things right now, which uh, with a completely Spanish speaking service that's going to be happening at our church, which I'm kind of excited about. And so, you know, this is something that I've prayed for. And I'm it was, but it's going to happen, Andy. It's just a matter of time. And yeah, so yeah. and maybe it's a church listening right now. Yeah, sure. Oh, I love it. Okay. So one of the things that excites me about you guys when I get around you and I'm around other people in AIM um, is you're not just thinking about maintaining a group, uh, an identity, or just serving the churches you have. Like you all have a plant, like you are planting churches. Like that's a big part of what you're doing. And that's part of what, why people are willing to pay apportionments or whatever you call it is because they see movement. Tell me about where AIM is going. Yeah, so one of the, you know, the church generally does three things, worship, disciple, and serve. And we want to come along the side of the church because the association is not a church, but it is an association of churches. And so like WBS, we we see ourselves as an association uh, organization that actually helps uh, resource um, pastors which then resource churches, which uh, we also see ourselves as, as, a, as an organization that creates these opportunities for people, such as we have money that's already put into Wesley Biblical Seminary, so that yeah. if anybody that's a part of AIM wants to audit a course, if any, anybody that believes they're called to ministry wants to take courses, as long as they're a part of an AIM church, we want to help scholarship that and so we have youth camps, we do these, um, we have these it, retreats as well, and, and they're all meant to, to create these opportunities to help local congregations, because again, that's where, that's where the money is, so to speak, it, it, that we're putting, like money as in like, we're not trying to get it from you, we're trying to push that out into the world, it's what we do is the local church, it's not, we're not trying to build up the organization of AIM, we're trying to resource pastors and churches uh, so that the kingdom grows, you know. Amen. Yeah, it, um, Adam, you guys are plant planting churches too, right? Yes, we've got, we've got plants that, that are happening here in the states. Uh, we, we currently exist actually in eight states, uh, most, most in the southeast, but, but states as north as Ohio. Um, we've got church plants also happening internationally. We've got, uh, we've, we've got one that's recently been planted down in Honduras. Um, we've got, uh, we really do have a, a, uh, a, 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 an international presence in Honduras, Ecuador, Mexico, Japan, Poland, Ukraine. And so we're kind of all over, uh, but, but primarily clustered our congregations are in, in the United States. Um, but, uh, we've got a church plant starting up in Brandon, Mississippi, uh, and, uh, that Marshall's been really, really involved in, in, uh, in helping raise up and develop the leadership there. Uh, WBS obviously being uh, instrumental in, in that as well, since uh, he's a, a student at WBS as well. But uh, yeah, we're, we've, we've got funding that's set aside for church plants. We're praying for church planters. Uh, yes, yes. Tell us the Lord's called them to plant and tell us where, and we're, we're ready to, to coach and resource and uh, get you out into the field planting these congregations. Wow. And, we're, and we're not afraid. We're not afraid, Andy, to... Um, to reach across denominational lines for help. Look, we know we're a small organization. So we've reached out to the Nazarene church at times for help. We've reached out to the Wesleyan church for help. In fact, we have uh, two cohorts that are happening right now that are trainings online for our pastors that we're helping to, to fund um, that are from two guys from the Wesleyan church with groundswell and a thousand churches. And mm -hmm. one, of them, one of them focuses on church health. The other's more church planting stuff. And, um, and we're also reaching out to another group right now that I'm, that I'm in contact with. So we're not a, we understand that we're small and we can't do everything that a big organization can do. That's when we reach out for help. We're not, we're not too, 
big to say, hey, we don't need any help. We know we need help. And and yeah. we, we believe in what these other groups are doing. We're not against them in any way. We just have a different polity. What, what if somebody is feeling right now like they feel called to church, planning a church? Um, what type of resourcing and support would you give to somebody? Let's say like, okay, we're here. And I, I'm looking at various denominations and I'm Wesleyan in my theology, but I'm just trying to figure out like what, what group I want to be connected to. Like what, sure. what, what do you all offer? Yeah. I mean, well, so I'm actually the, uh, the church health and multiplication chairman, which would be over church planting. And yeah. so you'd, you'd be talking to me at some point, number one, but what we, what we would do, Andy, is take a general assessment. And then we would take a serious assessment once we felt like this is somebody that, yeah, I think that, I think there is a calling here. We put them through and it is just, it, I've been through it myself. It is a wonderful assessment. And that's, that's a Wesleyan church, by the way, connection again, that we have there that helps do this assessing. And it is uh, extremely thorough because we want to make sure that person, their spouse is uh, on board with this because planting is some, just like pastoring. It's, it's got to be both. I know you know that as a salvationist or, yeah. you know, in, in that regard, it's like you got to both be doing it. It's not just one of you called, it's both. And so it tests all those factors. It, it talks about there's some coaching that goes along with it. So then then we would get that person into coaching as well um, and and take it from there. But then and forgive me, just to drill it down to like kind of one of the most practical things. Do you help them financially get started? Yes, for sure. For sure. Basically, if they go through our assessment and all, we're going to we're going to help all the way through um, as best we can, um, you know, with, with me and, and the church that I planted. Uh, AIM was there, you know, from the beginning uh, with Ryan Sawyer, who's in who's right close to you in Brandon, Mississippi. We're we're helping him along the way. We want them to get attached with the church, you know, locally as well. That that could be a mothering kind of situation, typically but we're not scared of parachute plants as well, uh, which is what mine was ultimately. And, and of course I had another church that acted as my, as our mother as well. So anyway, that, but yeah, absolutely. We want to fund that and we do have funds for that. So if you are interested, contact us, aim2020.com. There it is. I think this is so interesting. So I, I, I'm excited to talk to you guys because I think it's helpful for people to see there are other options at work. Now, sometimes there, there are various churches now, uh, United Methodist churches that are disaffiliating and they're walking through that process and they're trying to consider places to go. Are you guys open at this point to even receiving churches that would leave? I know that that's like, there's a little bit of caution with that because like we don't want to be taking taking another church, but if they've already decided like, look, we're not, we, we want to own our own building. We want to have more authority in the decision making, and we just feel like theologically we're not aligned with where United Methodism is going. So they broke it off, but but th that doesn't mean they necessarily have a place to go to. So are you all th thinking about that at all? Absolutely. In fact, we we are receiving new churches. We have so we when when a church decides to become a part of of the association, which interestingly enough, our members are congregations, not ministers. We license and, and credential ministers, oh, but okay. voting members are actually the, the local congregation. Whether it's a large church or a small church, each congregation, ha each member congregation has, has a single vote. Um, we have discerning associates, which is what we call people who are uh, congregations who are coming in for the first two years of, of their membership. They're discerning associates. They get to vote on everything except for constitutional changes or changes to the articles of, of faith or bylaws. Um, all other votes they get to take part in. And then we have covenantal associates where uh, they, along with the association, actually sign a covenant together, making various promises to one another. And, and those are the promises, uh, those are the vows that we, that we, uh, that we judge the, the, the health of the, of the relationship by. Um, so in the last uh, two, two and a half years, we've actually, I was looking at the numbers earlier uh, today. I think it's somewhere right around 250 inquiries we've gotten from organizations wow. wanting to explore what a relationship with the association would look like. Now, a lot of those are, are, are checking, checking out three or four different organizations because they're disaffiliating from that, from the United Methodist Church and they have a requirement to, to look into, I think three, a minimum of three. And so sometimes we just, it's not really a serious inquiry, but but we've sent out informational packets to a, around that many congregations in the last couple of years or so, 
Uh, we've we've got several active inquiries that are happening. We just in the last uh, year and a half, I believe, we've brought in, um, uh, I believe it's 13, uh, 13 new congregations in the last year and a half or so. Uh, maybe it was 16. I think it was 16 in the last year and a half or so. And so, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're every, I'd say every week, at least monthly, we're receiving new inquiries from, from, from congregations. And sometimes it's the pastor that'll reach out. Sometimes it's yeah. uh, the lay leader will reach out or a board chairman will reach out. And, and a lot of these, you know, I'm at the churches are forming kind of exploratory committees, discerning committees uh, right, to, right. to through that discernment process of whether or not they're going to leave the United Methodist Church. And then also if they do, what group they're going to be a part of, or are they going to remain completely independent? Marshall? Yeah. 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 And I would just, you know, add to that, some of these stories, Andy, that we're hearing, man, is just heartbreaking, to be honest with you. It, it's yeah, um, sure. the, the church was being choked out and mistreated the pastor and, you know, not, not to talk up our group. Look, there's plenty of great groups out there, but some of these pastors that have come in, they, they're just blown away by what little bit of love that we've been able to give to them that they've not been able to receive from, from, you know, other places. Let's just put yeah. it that way. And so when the disaffiliation happens, it's, um, there's a lot of pain involved in a, a lot of that. And of course, you know, we, um, we're not just, you know, we don't want to take in in hurt churches in the sense that they're not going to be healthy and stuff like that. But, but listen, if it's a landing place and if, if you you believe in the Bible and you want to be spirit led and believe in, in holiness, like, I mean, you know, we're a great landing spot if you don't have anywhere else to go right now. And if you want to leave later on, so be it. But um, it, it might yeah, be sure. a temporary landing place for some people until they can figure things out rather than just simply being out there on their own. Yeah. One last question I have is like, what does ordination look like for uh, the, in the aim process? And of course I, I'm very connected to that because we want to train pastors to serve healthy churches. So um, what, what does that look like for you guys? So I, I also chair our pastor parish relations committee. And so I'm over the, the credentialing process. Um, okay. You, you, you want to know like how a sausage is made? Like, you know, Oh, well, like, big, like what's the requirements, educational requirements, how long does we, it take? To so that's the interesting thing. We do not have educational requirements. Okay. Uh, it, really, it really is case by case. And, and that's one of those things where if we, if it was another way around, sure. It might make some things easier. Uh, but we've got pastors that with, we've got pa some pastors who hold PhDs, one of them being a professor at the, the seminary there. Uh, right. So uh, and, and actually, uh, Chris Lorstorfer, who also holds a PhD, he pastors one of our churches, but he's not credentialed with us. He's right, right. Another group. Um, and, and then we've got pastors who, who, uh, I don't even know if they made it, made it through high school. I'm not quite sure, but, uh, we've got a variety of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of academic, um, training, uh, uh, in, in our pastors, um, we uh yeah basically if, if if someone wants to be credentialed with us they they approach us they get an application we do references and and all that sort of stuff uh, to check on background uh and then we we put them through the interviewing process and move them move them through if they if they uh if they if they cut the mustard then we will uh we'll move them through the process of credentialing but uh uh, not everybody that applies does get through that process, but uh, you'd be you'd be blown away at the variety of of, of academic backgrounds that we have. Um, Interesting. High scholarship or none whatsoever. Um, yeah. yeah, this is fascinating. It's so it's so interesting to hear about this. I imagine some people are just really blown away to know that such a group exists. And that, that's exactly why I wanted to have you guys on, because I'm encouraged by the vision that you all have in, in trying to plant churches, resource pastors, find a way to exist as a group. Now, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having over these months as things are happening in broad Methodism, like, and I include all the denominations in that, I have on another uh, uh, pastor who's disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church, and they've created just a network. They uh, Shane Bishop, and they they have a group of 
and they're mainly large churches over 750 people each and they're they're just trying to come up with ways to resource each, each other but um and it, it's completely voluntary so th there's a lot of things to happen and this honestly i just believe this is an exciting time to be an evangelical methodist and and that means people who are in this stream of thought in the Wesleyan tradition, like we fought, like we're the grandchildren, so to speak, theologically of John Wesley, who takes scripture seriously, who are wanting to stand up uh, in this time. I think this is an amazing moment and you guys are a part of that. And I'm, I'm glad to just give you a little bit of space to talk about it. All right, you guys know, since you are my, some of my listeners, my regular listeners, I always ask is there's more to the story. So is there more to the story of Adam and Marshall? Maybe uh, something that you uh, don't talk about very much that, I might laugh at Marshall. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first, you know, because I've been anticipating this question. Oh, I, there it is. At the end of every, <laughs> and you'll like this one, I think, Andy. But, you know, when I was in seminary at West Biblical Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, I worked for the Salvation Army. And that's, oh, did where you? I, that's where I first learned that the Salvation Army was not just an organization, but was a church. And so I was working with Rob Pokai at the time who was who was in um in seminary with me later to become uh vice president at at, at seminary but yeah i worked for the salvation army so oh there you go what, what was your job i was a house monitor at the center of hope so i, I dealt with all the guys as they came in off the street or out of prison you know a lot of them come out of prison and and so i was helping with the um somewhat of a halfway house i mean that, that's how most people would understand what we were doing yeah, awesome. I'm sure you have a lot of stories from that. Uh, yeah. Adam, how about you? Well here, so. <laughs> so, so, yeah, more to more to my story. Um, part of uh, part of me leaving the Atlanta area to go to WBS at the time was motivated by my wife and I, who we met at AIM U Camp, and uh, um, we were we were diagnosed as infertile. And that was part of part of what launched us out. We said, let's leave Georgia, go to Mississippi, uh, started WBS, Katrina hits uh, a couple, few weeks later, and then she starts having morning sickness. And uh, that's 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 part of our story and how it dovetails with WBS. And, and then how many uh, children come from the gobble line right now? So our youngest is now nine. Uh, we, we now have nine and our youngest <laughs> is just a few months old, about seven months old. Wow. So, so seven months to how, how old the oldest? Uh, she'll be 17 in a couple of months. Woo! Wow. Adam, way to go, man. So much that, for infertility. Yeah. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much. Again, real quick, where can people find information? Marshall, you gave one website. Where can they find information about AIM? Yeah. AIM2020.com is our website and you can find our phone number and email and all that. Absolutely. Even in 2023. You can find AIM 2020. All right. What are you saying, Adam? No, I was going to say if 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 somebody wants to, they can always reach out to, to Marshall or me uh, just personally, directly. Um, okay, great. I'll include, well, maybe we can get your email addresses and we'll include those here in the show notes. So thanks so much for coming on, guys. It means a lot to me for you to take some time to, to tell us about this association and what it's doing for the kingdom. <laughs>